Okay, welcome back to Oracle Open World 2012. We are live, the CUBE coverage of Oracle Open World 2012. This is our third day of extended blanket coverage. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE.com. This is the CUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise and share that with you. I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. We're here with our friend Pauline Nist, always a great guest. Uh, Pauline's with Intel. Pauline, welcome back. Oh, thank you. Thank you guys <laughs> for having me. Oh, I really appreciate it. It's great to see you again. We have great memories, some great sound bites, but we want to kind of into, delve into the technical kind of like big picture. Larry Ellison, mm -hmm. obviously Keynote Sunday. I had predicted going in last week as a preview, I said, oh, we're going to hear all about big data, how he invented big data, and then, because last year we heard about cloud, and I'm like, oh, he didn't say anything about big data on Sunday, of course. Yesterday, he's like the king of big data. Um, and also, the role of hardware in this software company is all sun. So it's, that's their theme, hardware and software working together. So it's the Steve Jobs, I want to be Apple the Enterprise kind of ego going on yep. there. So, so, so that being said, what's your take on Larry's vision around the hardware and the software relative to what he's putting together? Well, I think the best example of Larry's vision is really what they've done with the Exadata boxes. And I have to say, as an old, long time, tried and true data center person, they really have done a lot of incredible engineering on the software side. I mean, don't get me wrong, um, all of the SSDs, the PCIe flashcards, all of the great Sandy Bridge chips in there all help, but what they have done with compression, what they have done um, with deduplication, what they've done with filtering data before they send it over to the CPUs, you know, I don't think that a lot of people thought it was going to be Oracle who broke new ground as fast in the database world when they came out with the Exaboxes, but I think they show that they're as nimble and clever about adapting to take advantage of the hardware uh, and really making it run better together. So we've joked in the past that the, Exa, the, the X in Exa is, stands for Xeon. Mm -hmm. We heard, heard a big push you know, this week around Spark. What's, so what's the deal? Steve Mills told me uh, over a year ago now publicly. Spark is dead, mark my word, word, you can quote me on it. We're going to see him at IOD, John. We'll have him on theCUBE, so we'll ask him about that. What's your take on what Oracle's doing with Spark? I don't purport to understand the relationship between Oracle and Fujitsu. I will just tell you what I know from dealing with our partners in Japan right. and our Japan organization, and that is that the Japanese government um, let out an RFP several years ago now, I think actually before the recession, because they want a CPU design firm in Japan. They want a Japanese CPU. Um, and at the time they let it out, both Fujitsu and NEC were bidding on it and NEC dropped out, and so Fujitsu picked up the contract. So Fujitsu is getting a very, very large check from the Japanese government to design CPUs in Japan with design teams, you know, with um, evolution of the semiconductor technology. Um, and that obviously is an, a very nice, um, prepaid voucher to kind of had to keep the technology going. So obviously Fujitsu partners, whoever they might be, would be able to take advantage of that investment. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, like I said, a farm subsidy, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is. <laughs> right, I mean, there's, there's no paper trail for that, but you know, the paper trail that is there is everybody knows what the Japanese government's doing. I mean, that's, that's very clear, and the question is going to be, are they going to re-up and do another generation of that? in the near future, and I think that's what everybody's waiting to see. So let's talk about Oracle and the data center. Larry has always wanted to have his own HP, his own hardware, he's got his, it's all coming together for him. This year his messaging's really tight, um, it's really solid, I like what he's doing, and I, I agree with you. You know, as much as we kid on Oracle, we do got to give him props for being clever and nimble. I mean, they've done, yep. they've, they, they're not a laggard. I mean, they definitely are not innovating. They, they embrace the uh, innovation of others and call it their own. We know that. Mm -hmm. But they're not sleeping. No, They no. are not asleep at the switch. Um, so that being said, fully integrated hardware, software, data center. Now in that marketplace, you can't have one vendor. So it's hard to become the apple of the enterprise. Right. What's your commentary on that approach of being the apple of the enterprise for Oracle? 
Well, I in my new job, I spend a lot of time with software partners and with the evolving sort of SaaS cloud past scene. And there's one big advantage that I, I think we're going to see emerge for the software providers, and I include Oracle, but I also include a lot of the partners that are here. If you're going to go to cloud, if you're going to actually run a database in the cloud, who are you going to trust to run it for you? I don't happen to think, as good as they are, that Amazon's the first place you go. If I want to run a database in the cloud and I want multi-tenancy and I want security, I'm going to go to Oracle. Just like if I'm a healthcare provider and I want to run my hospital in the cloud, I'm going to go to Cerner or Siemens or one of the guys who does that for a living. And so that's one of the advantages that I think, by virtue of the acquisitions that Larry's got, which is that he's got um, now not only database, but applications presence to go after that big chunk of enterprise database. And I don't think we ought to underestimate that because um, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a set of services that people will find more comfortable buying from him than perhaps other places. We had an entrepreneur on the CEO of Nutanix who said, Oracle sells to rich people <laughs> and um, their customer base. They, they pay a lot of money for Oracle software, and like you said, they don't want to go to the, the Amazon, which I've called in the past the, uh, the junkyard of cloud. Yeah, you can go build your own, you know? It's like, you know, <laughs> He said they don't care about TD Ameritrade, seven buck trades. They want the wealth manager, the they, Goldman yeah. Sachs. Well. <laughs> so yeah. so, so the, their clientele is used to having that kind of reliability and a partner to be catered to and, and deliver, and they don't mind paying for it. So the question is, as long as it can work, it's okay. So what do you think about that? Well, I think that uh, umbrella pricing is always very dangerous. <laughs> this, this market is littered by people who find it very hard to come down market and get taken out by people who come up market. Mm. Um, on the other hand, uh, you, I, and everybody else will try to hold whatever pricing we have as long as we have it, and we can do that in a market scenario. So I think that the challenge, and, and you know, the joke I always tell people is I've been coming to Oracle Open World probably for 20 years, and you go to the bars and you listen to everybody sit in the bars and piss and moan about the license prices and the checks they write to Larry. But the funny part is they're there every year. And when you come back the next year or the year after, and I've noticed no shortage of people in the bars still complaining about it. Now, what I do hear out here on the floor, like you, is lots of people providing, you know, I've seen a couple of the storage vendors give people lots of tricks for how you can do stuff uh, on your storage device and not have to pay for as many licenses, you know. So there's a lot of that that goes on. And the question is, when is somebody going to offer something that's an equivalent um, that is really deemed as being um, as good as yeah. um, for your transactions, for the stuff that really counts, um, and, and then they'll come in and they'll, they'll undercut yeah, the pricing. The switching, the switching costs are huge. And well, so what Larry does every year is he ups the table stakes and says, hey, whoa, 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 we checked all the boxes, we've got cloud, we've got multi tests we've got all these, mm -hmm. now we've got big data. So the headroom is there. Right. But the switching costs are so high. Right. And, and don't you think that Oracle, and any software company, is always going to figure out a way to preserve its license revenue, right? They've done so with virtualization. And they've, they've done, done so. you're absolutely right that they've done it across the board. <laughs> the question is, do you get to a point, for instance, where an Amazon decides that there's enough market for it to do a premium service, you know, a redundant, fault-tolerant cloud kind of service that starts resonating with corporate people because it offers more of what they're looking for, but at a price a price point above its kind of minimum entry price, but below the kind of premium pricing. And I mean, I always have faith in the capital market system. I, I mean, you know, high tech is, I used to work in Boston around 128, which doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> you know? And the thing that I always found most amusing about that is what the mini computer guys patted themselves on the back for doing the mainframes. Okay, Unix and the PCs did to them. I mean, it's a circle of life kind of thing, you know? It just goes around and goes around. Around. And we're seeing some massive forces right now, so let's go to the circle of life because you know there are emerging uh, trends that are kind of really on fire right now, and, and, they're, and it's all in parallel. The, on the business model side, on the technical side, and also on the market, with Flash, um, is changing the game. So storage is now a big part of that. So, so comment on the, on the dynamics of Flash. When we talked last year, uh, we had some good conversations. So talk about what's happened in one year in this whole Flash boom. Because a lot of people have changed their stories a little bit, but expanded their scope of their value propositions in the architecture level and the infrastructure. We've seen software-defined virtualization, all the way up to sand, caches, and all kinds of right. stuff. Well, I think the first inroad for, uh, for Flash, which we talked about previously, 
was the easy one. It was a solid state, solid state device. Um, you didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to change your software. You just had to pull out the hard drive. You had to put it in, and suddenly, boom, you got all this performance. At the beginning, you paid a little bit more, but the prices have, have sort of come down. And it had some interesting artifacts, which is less power and, oh, by the way, higher reliability because it didn't have things that spun around, um, <laughs> which is never a good thing. Um, now I think you're seeing the next tier of sophistication, which is everybody out here on the floor with these PCIe cards. It's what Oracle's done with the X3 box. It's what Fusion IO is here talking about. I mean, everybody's got a version of how to put the flash on there. But I think you're starting to see some hints in the industry for what the next big breakthrough is going to be, which is, yes, people are going to keep doing clever things in the storage stack with this generation, but you're already starting to see hints from people like HP and IBM and others about next generation flash technology, which is not just going to be a shrink or you know a little bit, uh, a little bit denser, a little bit cheaper. Um, it's going to be a new transistor type, and probably the people who've been most public about theirs is HP with Memristor, mm. where they've come right out and said we're on an aggressive schedule. And oh by the way, we're not going after storage; we're going after the DRAM business. This is going to be a memory tier device. Um, interestingly enough, IBM announced a deal with Hynix, another one of the flash players, about four months ago. They didn't say what they were doing with them. Um, obviously, Samsung would be involved in things like this. Intel would be involved in things like this. So I think you're, you're seeing us start down a road where we can see major, major changes in what everything from the memory through the storage tier is going to look like in another few years. Well, if you had to pick a technology to go into the enterprise, you probably wouldn't have started with Flash, right? No, no. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, now Apple and a bit, uh, the volumes of Flash are so huge because of, of the consumer market. Do you think that things like Memristor and other alternative technologies will be able to compete on a cost standpoint? Um, you absolutely need the client market. I mean, there is nothing being developed that people won't find very clever uses for in client. Because, I mean, we say it all the time when we're Intel, we can't make a market with Intel servers. It doesn't matter how many Xeons we ship, we need those, you know, million PCs a day going out the door to drive a volume curve. We can't even drive, you know, a, 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 a DRAM conversion. You really need it to happen on the client side to really load the fabs and, uh, and get the numbers there. So, so how's Spark going to do it? No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I, I have the same answer for Spark that I'd give you, you know, at, at IOD, which is, um, our guess today is that none of the risk guys are making any more than 150 to 200,000 chips a piece, yeah. um, but they can do a custom part that is totally optimized. Um, you, heard, um, you heard the Fujitsu guys talk about Oracle numbers. They can put special features in like that because they're not really constrained by how big the die is and what complexity they put in. And generally, the companies who can afford it are making boatloads of money on the software side. I mean, you only have to go look at Oracle software margins, IBM software margins, to understand that you can always have a boutique chip if you want a boutique chip. So we were talking about cloud earlier. Um, I think it's actually pretty clever what Oracle has done. They seem to have sort of skirted the hypervisor war and how they're sort of <laughs> buried it into the Oracle Red Stack cloud. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? I mean, what do you, what do you make of that and how do you think the uptake will be? Um, it, it gets back to what I said earlier about why people will trust them to do cloud databases. Um, I think part of what they're selling is security and the real world mm -hmm. hasn't solved those problems yet. Speaks um, to the CIO, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. exactly. That, uh, that they are, by controlling the whole stack, they're going to be able to go out and between the, um, the database containers and the, um, you know, owning the virtualization layer, say, we're going to make this safe for you. We're going to, you know, we're going to guarantee you that other people aren't going to get into your data. And I think in the real world, the you know, even our security strategies, the open source security strategies are still evolving in how people are going to support multi-tenancy and how they're going to give them the kind of security that people want to be in a, a cloud environment. Yeah, so one of the things that, I wonder if you could help us squint through this that Larry was talking about is that, he said last night, we, didn't, we don't believe that the way in which Salesforce and even Net, NetSuite when they started in the business uh, do uh, multi-tenancy, i.e. at the application Visually, layer, is right. the right way to do it. We've never felt that. We weren't ready with the database, like he didn't say that, but Oracle wasn't ready with doing it at the database right. level, so they just you know, did separate VMs. Um, now they've got 12C, they've got you know, multi-tenancy in the database. 
How real is that? I mean, one might observe, okay, well, of course Larry's going to say, we want to do it in the database. Uh, and of course the application guys are going to say, no, the application is the place to do it. Can you help us understand technically what the trade-offs are there? Well, I think, I think the trade-offs are where your crown jewels are. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Which is, uh, if, if, you're, um, if you're a healthcare provider, for instance, and you've got to deal with HIPAA, it's not the app that lets somebody log an order on the hospital floor. It's your medical health record that's got to be protected. And that's data, yeah. okay? So, so you can do what you want at the app day at the level, but that doesn't get you off the hook from having to guarantee to the HIPAA guys that you're protecting the data from ever being uh, uh, accessible to anybody who shouldn't see it. Um, and I think a similar thing is true uh, even in corporations for say things like your financial data where you're subject to Sarbanes-Oxley rules and audits. Mm. That's a little different than an app layer where you might be logging sales calls and you might be logging front log and, and you know it's not something you're going to get audited for on your quarterly reports. So I think your sensitivity to whether that is at the app layer or at the data layer kind of depends on again where your crown jewels are. And if your crown jewels are in the data, that's what you're going to care about. Mm. So let's talk about HP and the other big whales out there, obviously SAP, HP, um, in the enterprise. You're in the partner side, you're talking to a lot of partners, but big guys and the upstarts. Yep. What's your general take on the landscape, right? Obviously HP, we all know what's going on there. Meg Whitman's turning around the ship there, cleaning house, taking her medicine, and kind of retooling, which looks good actually on paper right now. Um, although the enterprise group's doing very, very well with Donatelli. Um, what's happening with those guys, and what are you hearing on the trends? What trends do you see? that are really exploding out, that are really have legs to them, or at least some potential to have legs? Well, I think all of the big guys, um, and you're going to hear it, you know, you're going to hear a message, I think, in many ways, very similar to what you hear here when you go to IOD. They're figuring out how to take the hype and the sex of the Hadoops and the cloud and everything and pull it in and incorporate it and connect it to their tools so that somehow you can still do all of the stuff that was familiar to you at the enterprise level, but incorporate all of this new stuff. The buzz, though, really, is on how does the new stuff take over the, the world? I mean, you know, there are people trying to figure out how to put transactions into Duke. You know, there are people working on, uh, you know, Google's got a his huge drill and Dremel thing on how to do analytics into Duke. You know, their theory is, if we do this the right way, we don't need any of those other databases. You know, we're going to inherit the universe. Now, personally, I'm thrilled to see that happen because database has been one of the sleepiest, most boring <laughs> technologies. You know, you you couldn't get a comp sci major to go into database five years ago to save their friggin' soul. Now <laughs> it's where the action is, you know, and to get a whole new generation of kids coming out of the Carnegie Mellons and the Stanfords who want to experiment and play with this stuff and to have an open source environment that lets that happen, I think it's great. It's great for competition, it's great for entrepreneurs, it's great for new stuff emerging. I mean, you know, we, we're going to be sitting here three years from now having this whole different conversation around what the, what the lay of the land looks like, I think. So, extend that out a little bit with some vision, because we'll just speculate. Big data, obviously Larry Ellison kind of giving what I call the kindergarten definition of big data, kind of a demo, it was pretty trivial. He kind of made it sound like it was complicated. But again, not too hard to pull off, but what he did point out is the business case. You know, so not so much the Twitter demo yep. that he did yesterday. It's like, okay, yeah, I, I could do that in a weekend. Um, but it's the business case. A brand manager wanting to ask the question, who should be sponsoring the Lexus car? Great right. demo right. for the business value. So let's take that out. So there's no, I don't think there's any debate about big data having value. How does that transform? With these new computer science majors and the data the role of data scientists, creativity is going to come from people. So what has to happen in your mind, given your experience, you've been through a lot of cycles, what are you watching uh, evolve? What, how is it going to evolve in your mind? This big data, technical, and then business? Well, I think, I think the, the interesting thing for these kids is they want to innovate something they can touch and play with. And the beauty now, I, I mean, when I was in school, we didn't have open source, we didn't have the Open Source Foundation, we didn't have Linux. You know, you had to go work for corporate America if you wanted to write code at the operating system level. And the neat thing now if you're in school is you've got Apache, you know, you got open source. I'm excited, I mean, Linux for a long time has really been frustrated by servers. Servers were a pain in their butt. We just wanted more complicated things. But now you got everybody looking at how do I connect these servers in parallel? How do I pull a dupe in to do stuff like that? And if you can touch it as a kid and play with it, you know, you and a group of a grad student friends, you know, can get together and, and propose a project and do it. And that's the beauty of it, which is you don't really need 
some big grant, you know, from DARPA. You don't really need some corporate sponsor. You, you know, I, I've, I worked at Carnegie Mellon when I first got out of school, you know, and there are crazy people down there doing all kinds of things in labs. Crazy and good. Let's, be, let's yes, define yeah, that. No, yeah, crazy right, good crazy things, good like things. radical ideas right. around configurations who, and who systems. Who haven't been burdened by, you know, stored procedures, you know, relational <laughs> yeah, databases. Yeah, yeah. So let's get back to Flash. So I look at Flash as like addressable memory back in the days when, you know, we would program, I mean, back in the early 80s, you know, when I was cutting my teeth on code, you had 64K to work with. And that was a lot back then, you know. Yep. I, you had to load an editor and you had to, you know, it's just hard to, now you got um, RAM and you got Flash. So Fusion IO has a software development kit. So the trend is making that non-spinning disk Flash programmable for developers. Not like the engineering the, uh, hardware developers, but like software developers. So right. what's your take on what might come out of that revolution, that capability? Well, see, what I think is going to come out of that revolution is it's just going to look like a second tier of memory. You're not going to need to know anything more than how to read and write to it. That's the end point we're going to get to. It's like a level store. Hmm? <laughs> well, I, no, I actually think it'll be a 2LM. I mean, um, you guys probably aren't old enough to remember it, but back in the day, there was an IBM mainframe that actually had DRAM and core, if you remember what real core memory was. You know, the little ladies strung together in, yep. in Asia. Um, and, um, and it was a two-level memory, because DRAM was just so outrageously expensive that you couldn't, you, you kind of used it almost as a cache to the core memory. And I think we're going to get to that kind of point with the next generation of Flash, which is you'll use DRAM as a much, much bigger kind of caching device, but you'll have this huge persistence store um, that you can also, uh, you know, read, write, address. And it's not going to take magic to do it. It's going to give it to kids who want to write code and play with it, particularly when they can get the operating system code and the Hadoop yeah, code. I, I totally agree with you. I think we are on the beginning of a complete revolution in systems programming right. for dummies. I yeah. mean, you're talking about a complete software-specific, software-led movement that takes the hardware equation out of it yep. and gives the power of many, many mainframes to a kid. I mean, I actually, I actually think that was the beauty um, the only thing I can liken it to in my lifetime is what the VAX did with virtual memory. So that you could get away from all the partitions and the overlays and all the crap that we all grew up with. Yeah. And it was suddenly the illusion of, ha it was good enough that you really did have the illusion of having unlimited memory. Yeah. And you, did, you suddenly had a whole generation of kids who didn't know what it was like to ever be memory constrained. And that gave birth to a whole raft of applications that got developed uh, for those machines simply because you could. Yeah. So let's talk about, um Another trend, we talked briefly about at uh, IDF, um, on our, which we have on siliconangle.com. If you go to youtube.com slash siliconangle, we have Pauline's interview at uh, Intel Developer Forum here in San Francisco uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, but there's a trend that we talked about, network virtualization, software-defined networking, now being uh, marketed as software-defined data center, which I love, it's like a path, it's like, it's like get there, it's nirvana, you get and everyone's happy. But it's still far away. Share with the folks what's happening in that world um, at a big picture level and how partners are reacting to it. Is it the next big boom like Flash has become? Um, there's a lot of hype with it because Nasir was bought by VMware. You can see Larry kind of teasing out you know, that kind of direction. He didn't really say anything specific, but you can see the dots forming. Well, they actually did. Fowler talked about, uh, who, uh, I always forget how to say, Zigo, is that who it works? Zygo, Zygo, Zigo, yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, Fowler yeah. talked about it this morning. Um, that's Oracle bought, they were kind of the number two SDN behind NYSERA. And Oracle snapped them up the week after VMware bought NYSERA. So Larry was obviously thinking and watching. And so they uh, positioned that as, as, as SDN. And yes. But it's sort of, to me it was more IO virtualization, but maybe they're no, closer than I, I think. Well, I, you're right. I mean, I think they took, Oracle today took kind of the first step in positioning it. But um, I, I would actually, not leap from SDN to software defined data center. I think VMware wants you to do that, yeah. and that, that was the position you heard from VMware for the week that they were here. But I think there's more than enough to bite off in just the software defined networking space, because it's a world that's owned by relatively few players today. And it's emerging. And yes, and um, I think that the world wants to go open. I mean, the virtualization guys want it more than anybody because they want to see and manage the network, which is why Oracle wants it, which is why VMware wants it. But I think we all benefit from a network that is more easily managed for performance. I mean, the problem you have today is, as you've seen here, you can add more processors, you can add more PCIe cards, you can add more SSDs, 
The one thing you can't add easily is more network bandwidth. I mean, you know, you're sort of locked in. You, could, you said at HP Discover, network is the bottleneck. Yep, exactly, exactly, and that's the last, I mean, you know, this, this game, this industry has always been a find the next bottleneck game. I mean, for years it was CPUs, now you got CPUs coming out Storage your ears. Storage is now check. Storage is now check, now where do you go next? You go to the network. And Hello, you gotta converged have infrastructure, we're back. Yep. All the naysayers, we were talking about that earlier yesterday, but we're, we're poo-pooing converged networks a few years ago. Right. We're here. Right. What do you think of this notion of software-led infrastructure, though? Are you saying it's going to be confined to the network, or? No, I just think we have to walk before we can run. We got to solve the network problem really well, and then we can move back to solve the data center problem. I just don't want to see people turn solving the network problem into somehow the data center problem. They're two very, very different sets of, of solutions, and when you solve the, the networking problem, you have to solve it at all tiers. You've got to solve it in your servers, you've got to solve it in the backbone, you've got to solve it in the phone companies and the comms infrastructure, because if you don't solve it through the whole system, you'll just move up the bottleneck chain. I mean, you know, the, you know, the joke in the U.S. these days is that the bulk of the U.S. bandwidth between six and nine at night is consumed by Netflix, so we're all paying the penalty, <laughs> and, and that's because the core backbone infrastructure is getting saturated. It's not because, uh, you know, the Amazon servers or whatever, there's just so much being pumped out, and that's that's why I say it's a it's a big string of things to, to change because you can give IT guys the tools to you know make make malleable configurations in their four walls, but if the stuff they connect to also doesn't change, they're going to hit a brick matter. wall. Excellent. Let's talk about IOD, um, the IBM uh, on demand event, uh, information on demand from IBM coming up. We're going to have the cube there. Um, what, do, what do you think about what's going on with IBM? And and you mentioned they're going to showcase some of the big data stuff, but IBM obviously. Is, been a great turnaround story. Their market cap's the largest of yep. all the companies on the list that we review here at, at Oracle Open World. HP still going to work their way up, but IBM, they're in a good position. What's your take on them right now relative to the world that's evolving around them? Well, I think people have talked about it for a long time, but the real flavor you get from IBM that's different than you get here is they're a business services company. It's, it's a company that's really led by the services guys. And they're going in there to solve business problems, you know, whether it's to you know, run expense vouchers for a company, or do analytics for a company, or, uh, or you know, provide a solution, but they don't tend to couch the, the sale in terms of, I have a database to sell you, or I have this to sell you, or I have that to sell you. It's, what's your business problem, and how can we help you solve the business problem? Um, the whole Smarter Planet theme. And I think there are relatively few people who can get their hands around it as well as they can. Um, and the question is, can they do it in ways that are going to help us innovate and move forward? Uh, because they certainly have the arsenal. I mean, you know, they've got solutions in every dimension. I have, um, you know, you can't look at their uh, analytics portfolio and in these days of big data, not view that they, at least in the near term, have the mega advantage of being able to do something with big data that actually gets you dollars out the other end. And, you know, I think they'll be, they'll be wise enough to play that, but um, uh, that's, a, that's a big deal right now. I mean, they've, they've kind of gone, you know, just like Oracle, they've done lots of acquisitions, but rather than do it at the apps tier, they've done it at the analytics tier. And the question now is, can they print money because of big data? Do you see uh, IBM as Oracle's biggest competitor? That's interesting because um, on the one hand, you know, if you did the Venn diagram, there'd certainly be a big chunk of overlap space mm. in the middle where if you want an enterprise, high-end enterprise database, you know, you're looking at IBM or you're looking at, uh, at Oracle, but then the question is, what do they bring in the rest of their circle? And that's the part where they're fairly different. But then the other one that we talked about earlier that I don't ever underestimate is, you know, the, the number one by volume database provider in the world is Microsoft. You know, and if you go with the old strategy of, uh, of coming up from the bottom is always easier than coming down from the top, you got to wonder um, over time if, if that doesn't also have its appeal because they're guys who are looking at cloud. You know, um, you know I think Microsoft today and Oracle today um, are the two big guys who are making, so I, I just looked at the top 10 cloud providers that IDC put out, and of course, you got Salesforce, you got Adobe, and you got you know, a bunch of the typical people you would Microsoft's see. Microsoft's right there, But the yeah. two people, the two corporate people you see are Microsoft and then Oracle, yeah. which is actually kind of interesting. Right, well, that, that is interesting. So, you know, we've been following that now for the last couple of years, but you know, what's interesting is that Larry's not specifically called out 
Microsoft, at least that I can remember, John, at Oracle Open World. You know, he's certainly called out Salesforce, no. he's right. calling out EMC, I think he's, he's taking pot shots at IBM. Right. Uh, but, but not Microsoft, and it's Maybe it's, it's interesting. the pricing. Yeah, you know, yeah, well, <laughs> right. You know, but, you, but your point right. is, I mean, they're, they're everywhere still. Because the guys, is, a lot of the guys he's called out are guys that he wants to take customer dollars from. I mean, you know, I said to people when the Exa boxes came out, be very, very careful. He's not just going after the server companies, the HPs and the IBMs. He's going after every soft, every um, storage yeah. partner that he's got on this floor. You know, because you, you look at how many EMC or NetApp boxes are connected to Oracle databases, and if you buy an Exadata, you don't need those. Where does the revenue from that move to? You're still putting those bits somewhere. You're just paying Larry for them. Pauline, talk about Intel for a minute, because Intel obviously going through some changes. IDF was a really refreshing conference this year. Although it did seem a little bit kind of uh, smaller scale, not a lot of hype, a marketing hype, but like just meat, meat and potatoes Intel, you know? and. Uh, the role of storage has changed. And so talk about how that is affecting us. We're talking about you know, checking the boxes, right? Each, you guys have always crushed it on the, on the chips and the, 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 the PCs and the servers. Uh, storage is second check in the industry and it's then got networking. But So how does that relate to Intel? If we're checking the boxes, servers, storage, networking. Well, I think, um, I think we are as interested in anybody in pursuing this NVRAM technology. We're just not talking publicly about it yet. Uh, I think a little bit of what you got at IDF was, quite frankly, um, we were out there very early and very loud about wanting to get into phones and tablets and other media and didn't really hit the dates and the marks we had. So now the rules are until you got a product, you don't stand up and say you got a product. Until it's shipping with a partner, you don't stand up and make a lot of noise about it. So um, I think we've kind of learned from our past mistakes that, you know, the we've got to go out there and sell the product and sign up the people who are going to ship it. And, and IDF was actually you know, kind of interestingly timed because I think when it first went on the calendar, everybody had hoped Win8 was going to be shipping. And of course, when that slid out till the end of the month, we kind of ended up in this funny never, never land where we could show a lot of Ultrabooks and we could talk, but the software is not our product. We couldn't launch it for our partner. Um, so it, it, life yeah. is timing, you know? Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Yeah, but the messaging was awesome. I was on yep. the Twitter stream and you're doing my normal tweet thing, live tweeting on the keynotes. Yep, you were. Very awesome messaging, intelligent systems. Um, you guys are more solution focused. We were talking about that well, briefly. Less chips, speeds, and feeds. I don't think Dottie had one speeds and feeds slide in his whole presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Quite impressive, and, and now the role of storage group, because uh, David Tui, who we, I interviewed, and also he's been on theCUBE multiple times, they seem to be taking on more of an expander role. They always seem to be not as popular as the data center guys within mm -hmm. Intel, which you know, is the, it's, the, it's the cream of the crop over there, data center, but storage always gets, a, Dave and I always talk about the storage guys, always kind of get the, the bad rap, but now storage is the hottest thing and it's leading the charge in a lot of these with Flash well, and everything else. I think the renaming of the group, the data center group, you know, and particularly with Diane, who's the next CIO coming in, you're going to see a lot more focus on storage and on networking. I mean, look at what we've done in Fabrics. We've bought Fulcrum, we've bought the QLogic InfiniBand assets, we've bought the Cray assets, so I think, we didn't buy them just to put them on the shelf. You know, you're going to see us invest in those areas because we understand that as the silicon is getting faster, interconnecting the pieces is also important and not having those bottlenecks so that, you know, as you've seen here, the IO doesn't become a bottleneck, the network doesn't become a bottleneck. Um, we're very, very interested in SDN as an open standard remaining, you know, and, and I know that VMware has said good things and we're all going to hope that they deliver on those good things, but we're also going to take advantage of the standards bodies and everything because we don't want to go another round of, of, of a very closed network subsystem because you need all three. You need, it's a three-legged stool and you know what happens to a stool if you cut off one of those legs, you end up on the floor. <laughs> you mentioned InfiniBand. Larry, of course, loves InfiniBand. Yes. I mean, he's crazy about it. For the QLogic booth, you guys bought the InfiniBand assets from QLogic. This HPC business, John and I were out at, uh, was it the DDN analyst meeting, was it last week? Yeah, it was last week. Yeah. At DDN's, it's you know, kind of a niche storage company, mm -hmm. but they're into HPC. And the premise that they put forth is that you know, the HPC world is just set up perfectly to support big data. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could comment on that, um, just generally. Well, I think um, it, it's actually kind of interesting, because with my history at Penguin, you know, for a long, long time, um, 
volume clusters with Ethernet, you know, was where all the money and all the, you know, the, the heat was. And there was this lunatic fringe playing around with InfiniBand, but you had to be, you know, a government agency who was doing something peculiar and you really were going to pop for, you know, all of those InfiniBand cards. And as the CPUs have become faster and faster, you've seen more and more people on the HPC side moving, you know, to run MPI over InfiniBand. And just as you've seen on this side, um, the data intensive guys uh, like Oracle and like IBM moving to use InfiniBand. So, you know, obviously there's something going on there and I think that um, the role of HPC, which has actually been pretty interesting, and we talked a little bit earlier about the Japanese government, but what the U.S. government has done is really used its resources to push HPC and to believe that if you push it to get to the high water mark in terms of either size of clusters or number of computes or interconnect, that will waterfall down to the rest of technology. And I mean, you know, you know, it's an alternative to what Al Gore would like to have you think it really was DARPA who invented the internet, but nobody wants to talk about that because that means you'd have to acknowledge an agency that we don't want to talk about. <laughs> but. Um, but you know, the government's going to do that. The government's got exascale and you know, petascale computing going, and there are certainly large elements of that that look very similar. I mean, Hadoop hasn't gotten there yet. Hadoop, everybody wants to build with cheap parts. You know? I just want to put these, these cheap servers and these cheap interconnects together, but when you get really serious about doing something with the data and running analytics on it, you're going to want computes. And the minute you amp up the computes, then you're going to want to amp up the I.O., and then you're going to say, well, maybe an InfiniBand cluster really is what I want, but obviously that's not going to come out of, of open source. Open source is going to sort of stay with yeah, yeah. the Com volume, you know, the Commodity volume hardware. solution. Yeah, industry, exactly. Or industry standard hardware, hardware as right. people always smack me around, but it's both, right? It's the commodity yeah. low, low end and right. industry standard like right. Dell and HP. Um, so you think it's, it's it's hand in glove with the, the yeah, HPC? Yeah, it's I do, I do. I think there, there are pieces that, that HPC will drive it and refine it, and as it and but it takes the rest of the world to adopt it and sometimes drive the. I mean, Mellanox would not have been a huge success if all they had done was sold to the lunatic fringe of HPC. Right. I mean, we would nobody be talking about a let alone would Larry buy five percent of them or something? Yeah, right. <laughs> so let's talk about like the um, systems because we bring up the talking about the Vaxes and core memory back in the day. Um, a lot of the Hadoop big data stuff that you see out there are built on commodity gear, and so that's you know racks and stacks. And at some point, an engineer is going to, have to say, "Hey, you know what? I'm going to do a billion calls a second someday uh, on an API, and I'm going to have to build my own mainframe or mainframes, plural, parallel systems." How would you look at that right now? Because a lot of companies, and we face this as we talk about our products that we build uh, in our data center, not, not today, but like at some point, it's not just hiring the software guys. You have to get some hardware engineers to say, "Hey, let's do an InfiniBand cluster. Let's look at the compute." I.O., what is, what is, how does that evolve in your mind's eye, right, from today? Let's just take our case study, for example. Like, you know, we have a couple servers, we're going to grow, and, and a lot of people who are doing MongoDB, they're all doing the same thing, right? They mm -hmm. may be racking and stacking right. uh, in, on premise in their own private data center because it's too expensive to do I.O. in Amazon. They maybe do a little Amazon out here, but ultimately they have their own data center. What's that, that system look like if they have a clean sheet of paper? Well, I, you, have a, you have a bunch of things going on simultaneously. You got the guys like Google who are so big that they design their own motherboards to rack and stack and pack and you know, get them in and, and cool them with ambient air you know, and all of that kind of, of neat stuff because they're trying to bring the cost down. Um, and I think you're, you've always had the guys, and, and you see it even more so today because the rise of the um, ODMs, the, you know, the offshore manufacturers, and the tier two guys have always given people like yourself who want to play, the ability to go get a board and rack and stack them and put them together yourself. I mean, you know, at Penguin we used to do that all the time. <laughs> um, and so there's some of that playing around that goes on. I think the challenge that We you call get, it ghetto servers, <laughs> a, get, a ghetto data center. <laughs> That's actually even you know? worse than commodity, and I didn't think I'd find something that was, I'm not sure I appreciate being I mean, called ghetto servers. They're like boards, oh, no yeah, shells, yeah. it's like, <laughs> yeah. what is that, you know? <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta it's it's put, below commodity, it's, it's, it's like it's above plankton. You know? in and sit the fan next to Plankton, it. Plankton, ghetto, yeah, yeah, commodity. Yeah. And that's always going to happen where people want to play around. The question is, at what point, like I know guys who are hosting out of their garages, but suddenly the minute that they start selling the service, even if it's to some you know, lawyer down the street or some local, local uh, business, Suddenly, now they care about a little bit of UPS protection, and now they care about yeah. you know having parity on stuff and making sure it's really going to run because they want the guy to send them the check every yeah, month. Right. So it's kind of where you are in the food chain. You personally will adapt 
to fit whatever you can afford to fit, just like you do with the car you drive. Yeah, we were having this conversation with the MongoDB president, his name's Max, uh, and, and Mongo scales well for LAMP developers, but all of a sudden, the breaking point is a little bit higher up now, they can scale up to the point where they got to re-engineer. So, yeah. that's well documented. There's a hardware failure model, right? It's like, okay, I'm hosting on Amazon, everyone, Zing is a great case study, they did Amazon, then they went private. Where's that scale point for hardware? in your mind, for those kinds of rapidly growing companies, you know, crazy game company goes from zero to, you know, dr you know uh, draw on a scale, for example, huge growth company went from zero to 50 million people, like literally in weeks. Well, I think, I mean, I think Netflix is a perfect example. They just announced they're totally getting out of running any more data centers on their own, they're going to go to Amazon. I mean, they announced it two weeks ago, I think. And you would think if anybody could have the scale, it would be somebody like Netflix. But the flip side of it is, um, What's your business? Is your business the content business or is your business running data centers? And where suddenly have you changed so that now you got this focus of I got to worry about pipes, I got to worry about networks, I got to worry about yeah. you know peak load. I mean, that's that's an art and a science of its own and you want to you know find people who are going to do that for you and make some mistakes the hard way so you're not online some night between 7 and 9 or you're going to hire somebody who already has perfected it. And I think you see a lot of that going on. Well, you think of the big switch, right? Yeah. But, but at the same time, not a lot of people are, you know, big scale guys are running their business on Amazon. I mean, Netflix is a clear example, but Zynga's gone the other way. Right, right. Example. So which way do you see the trend going? It's going to yes. be just like computing <laughs> is today. I mean, you know, you've got, uh, you've got corporations, some of whom still think mainframes are the answer. You have corporations who are totally running private clouds on, you know, Xeon boxes. That's the beauty of this technology. I mean, you know, there's a solution for everybody. And I, you know, are there going to be some people that do a little better and some people that do a little worse? It's, sure. you know, it's where do you want to put your cycles and, and who are your core. I think a lot of it has to do with your core manpower and whether you've got mm. people who, you know, did you hire a bunch of CMU grads along the way and you don't want to lose them or the Stanford kids and they still want to keep doing this for you? Or do you have to hire them as you grow, at which point you say, maybe that's not what I want to do. But a couple of years ago, it looked like the cloud service providers were really outpacing the, you know, the enterprise IT. It feels like the gap has closed a little bit. I mean, I know CSPs are still growing faster, they're innovating faster, yep. they're investing. But the enterprise guys have really got their act together with mm -hmm. private cloud, haven't they? And that, has that gap closed and, and... Well, I think what the enterprise guys have had to do, there's nothing like your CFO being a force of function and say, bring me a make buy. I mean, Diane did it when she was our CIO. Should we be buying cloud outside or should we run in our own cloud? You know, and she went in and showed him what she could do for the same or less than going outside and still have the protection and everything else. And that's why we've got our own infrastructure cloud. Um, so you have to do that make buy analysis, but I'll tell you who loves the buy. I mean, when we were at Penguin, when you're at a startup, you know, you got 80, 50, you know, 120, 500 people, pay as you go is a godsend, you know? You have a bad quarter, you just crank down those Salesforce seats, you know? <laughs> you can cut your bill in half. <laughs> I mean, where else can you yeah. say that? And that's, I think, the piece of the market that really, really responds well to that kind of a service offering, which is you have an enormous amount of flexibility. You don't have to, you, you can take advantage of having Salesforce or SAP or anything else you can buy as a mm. service and really literally not have the capital, not have the physical plant, not have the people, just you know, pay for it as an expense budget. What was, uh, you mentioned Diane a couple times, Diane Bryant, what, what was her message in the keynote this morning? I presume you, you watched um, I think I think her, her big number one message was that IT is going through a major transformation and that um, these guys, exactly what I just said to you, which is the competition is the cloud and you've got to show that you can be as efficient, as agile, um, you know, at moving as they are and you've got to demonstrate it to your management. But then she got into doing it as the three components we've been talking about, which is it's not just servers anymore, it's servers and storage, uh, it's, it's networking and, and, and infrastructure and that you've really got to use all of the technology you can and you know, then she talked about Exa is a great example of working with a partner like Oracle where we've helped put all of those components together um, to demonstrate that, but that you as an IT person have got to do that in your own shop through a variety of ways, whether you decide to go cloud, whether you decide to build a private cloud, whether you decide to buy an appliance, you know, the efficiency demands and the growth demands and everything else aren't going to go away. Do you see the, that, I'll call it a hybrid cloud, but, but I, by, by that I mean specifically a federated Mm -hmm. hybrid cloud, you know, where you're federating applications. Do you see that as a trend that's taking hold and, and, and what's your update on that? I still don't see it yet. Mm. I'm waiting like you guys are, but I don't think we have all the pieces. 
Um, What's missing, you think? Um, I think what's missing is probably a combination of three things. There are some technology problems we still haven't solved in terms of the security um, and the protection. I think there are some standards that we've got to get a critical mass to buy into, and they're starting to emerge, though obviously some players will support standards and some players won't support standards. I, that's going to happen. Um, and, and then I think the, the last one just has to be that you have the confidence in the ecosystem to solve your problem and put your business there. Do you think that Oracle made some inroads in, in some of those three this week? Yeah, uh, I do I think do Oracle too. made yeah. some inroads. Yeah. Um, but I also think that, um, I think, getting back to what I said earlier, the biggest tension in this system is going to be open versus, I won't even say proprietary, semi-open. <laughs> You know, and, and where does that land? And, and, and I haven't seen you know, the answer yet. But Oracle's value proposition is, hey, if you go all Oracle, you can do oh, that. Oh, exactly, you know? and that's exactly what Microsoft's proposition <laughs> and, 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 is going to be, and exactly what IBM's proposition is going to be, and VMware's proposition is going to say the same VMware's thing with its partners, so, right. so you've got these uh, stovepipes of I said, clouds. I said tension. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Let me ask you a question about big data. When I were running out of time, you got to go, but um, we're going to wrap out. We've got plenty of time to end the day here, but big data. So the big debate that everyone has, I mean, you talked about Larry's presentation, and we were kind of critical of it, but there's a big confusion around what's the hard tech involved, right? So let's talk about the big data demos you see. You've seen our little tool there, Viewfinder, uh, that we're building. Um, and Dave and I were just talking about this. It looks easy. Get some Twitter data, get some little data, make it work story, bring it in real time. What is the hard tech about real time analytics? In your mind, from your personal geek perspective, you know, thinking about the complexity. Help people understand where is it easy and where is it difficult. What's and he the means geek is a compliment, by the way. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you yeah. what I think is the hardest question. Tech I, no, that's okay. <laughs> geek is okay. Um, the hardest one in my mind is what I'll call real, real time, because you now have got near real time and relevant real time and all these other things that people put in that say, well, I used to do it in 30 days and now I do it in four hours and that's real time. Real time to me, from the strongest arbiters of real time, and I, I can give you an Intel example, is when you want to use big data to instrument a production line and you literally want to keep that production line within operating margins 100% of the time. I mean, at Intel, the way we measure our plant managers is that as we calculate the maximum number of chips that should be able to be produced by that plant if it was working you know, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and was yielding at whatever the highest possible yield number was. And anything less than that is a failure. Okay, so when you... Boy, there's a line for that job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if, if you're a fab guy, it's the yeah. most challenging fab yeah. in the universe. Yeah. But, what they, but, but this is also complicated today that you don't have people who watch it, you keep people out, people are contaminants. I mean, you know, one skin particle from you is not something we want in the room. But what you have to have is this is all monitored electronically, and the minute any piece of production equipment starts to vary out of parameters, you need to fix it instantly, or what you're going to get is some chunk of chips in the middle that were processed during that period that are bad. Um, it's the same thing with people who instrument wells. I mean, I had uh, an energy guy tell me that he totally instruments all of their wells these days because if they can keep a well in the ground four extra days or five extra days or a week before the bottom collapses, they will more than pay for any computer system you can sell them to do that analytics. And that what they do, what they used to do is they used to put their best people out there and listen and make guesses about what was going on at the bottom of the well and now they don't do that anymore. They totally instrument it and it's down to you know minutes of precision. That is real, real time to me. But the consequences to them are what? If they that don't they're have going it. to lose huge amounts of money. Yeah, so that's yeah, where you yeah, see that. Yeah, yeah. So and then <laughs> so then you move from that to what I call near real time, which was I was at the SAS conference. Macy's wanted to do one very big thing this year. Every retail establishment in the world up to this point in time has had um, internet inventory, web inventory, and store inventory, and they were like two different countries. And if you sold out on the web, your only recourse was to march your little <laughs> button to the store and find it in the store. And what they realized was they had stuff they were selling out of on the web that wasn't moving in some stores, it was actually being marked down when they could sell it for full price over here. 
so their goal was unify my inventory so that my inventory is one big picture and then I'm going to create 240 or some number of superstores that will actually ship directly to a web customer. So if you find it and it's in the store, it goes from the store directly to you. To you. It doesn't go to a merchandising center and they wanted the ability to reprice the entire inventory in four hours. So let's talk about the tech involved. How hard is this? What's the hard thing? Is it the database? The hard, is it the compute? Is it the everything? The hard, well, but I, I the mean, data? they were tell, they, yeah. yeah, I mean, the the, hard, the first hardest problem was just unifying the data, because I'm sure they had two separate systems that did it, and it's a big volume of data. But the second one is, I think, the analytics and the time frame. What do I more, I mean, because it's not just reprice it, it's intelligently reprice it. Okay, notice that it's sold out on the web, so I don't want to mark it down in the store. Or notice that it's the Friday after Thanksgiving, and by God, I got this one thing that ain't moving for crap, and I better lower the price by 50% before tomorrow morning, is the kind of intelligent pricing that you're looking for, that kind of stuff. So that takes a lot more smarts and a lot more analytics than just saying, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to unify the inventory and unilaterally reprice everything 20%. Mm. That's the dumb way to do it. What you want to do is selective markdowns that keep stuff moving but maximize your revenue. Okay, well final question, it always gets what for you uh, here, is what's on your mind going forward? Share with the folks your vision for the next year between this Oracle open world and the next time we sit down. That's, a, that's an interesting one. I think, um, as we've been talking about, you're going to see a lot more move um, to use SSD or, or to use Flash um, to continue to speed up that processing. I think you're going to hear, certainly from Oracle next year, hopefully a lot more everywhere about software-defined networking. I mean, that's one that's just getting kicked off now and I think everybody wants to jump into because it's kind of um, the next bottleneck that people see that they've got to get their hands around. Um, and uh, a lot of people working on it, so that'll be an interesting piece to see what it takes to actually make progress and how quickly people are willing to adopt it after they start coming out with some solutions. I mean, I think, the, I don't know about you, but I think the Flash stuff has moved pretty quickly. It took a while for people to kind of jump into SSDs and believe the price points were okay, you know, they were a little nervous about it, but now it's like everywhere. It's, I mean, it's just everywhere, and hopefully we'll get software-defined networking to that stage. Well, okay. I think in the case of Flash, it's about the business case, too, and it's starting oh, yeah. to become yeah, clear, exactly, isn't it? Exactly, so, exactly. Pauline, okay. fantastic having you on again. Thanks very much for all your time. No Pauline problem. Pauline uh, executive at Intel, uh, senior executive, uh, business person, and also she's got a geek technical side of her in a complimentary <laughs> way. Um, it's always good to have technical chops and be an executive at a big company like Intel. Um, so thanks for coming on theCUBE. This is SiliconANGLE's theCUBE. We'll be right back with uh, Oracle, more Oracle open world coverage right after this break. <laughs>